several years ago, I got this email from one of our staff members, and it was sent to several other staff members, but it was a foreword from one of our elders. And this elder had had this idea that he wanted us to know about. And to be honest, I, I didn't read the email as thoroughly as I should have. I kind of thought I got the gist of it. And the idea seemed kind of ridiculous. And so I just hit reply all. And when I sent it back, it was just, it was kind of a sarcastic response to this idea, basically showing how ridiculous it was. And so I sent it off and didn't think anything of it. And then my gut dropped when I got an email a few minutes later from the elder that had this idea saying, Steve, I didn't appreciate your sarcasm. Apparently he was on the email thread. I didn't know that when I hit reply all. And so he wasn't very happy and he had every right to be upset with me. I was sarcastic. I was arrogant sounding. I just was a plain jerk. And uh, I also didn't know he was on the email. And so <laughs> uh, I apologized to him and he took it very, very graciously. Uh, but I, I just felt like there, I wish I could do something more. I apologized, but I felt like there was more that I should have done. And again, I, I didn't get fired somehow, but, uh, but I'd love to say that this is, you know, the only time that I've ever said or done something stupid that hurt somebody else, but it's, it happens far too often. You, you ever hurt someone? You ever done something or said something that hurt them? And, and you, you apologize, you said you're sorry, but sorry just, it just doesn't seem to cut it. Like you need to do more to make things right. Well, last week we started this series on the book of Leviticus. Uh, two weeks ago, we, we kind of gave an update on our all-in campaign, our all-in initiative, and talked about some of the positive momentum we were having from that. And so we decided to kill the momentum by doing the book of Leviticus. But um, we're not doing a verse-by-verse -verse study through this book. What we're doing is we're spending five weeks in this series, and each week we're, we're trying to cover one prominent topic in this book that's also important to us as Christians and how we are, live today. So last week, the major theme, and maybe the major theme of Leviticus, was the topic of holiness. We talked about holiness. Today, we're turning our attention to another major theme, and that's this word atonement. So atonement is, is what it takes to make something that is wrong right. The root word uh, carries with it the idea of a covering over, to cover over an offense to make it right. So atonement is defined as reparation for a wrong or injury with the goal of reconciliation. And really, we could break this word down into three parts. at one -ment, at one -ment. It's the bringing together into harmony that which was separated, that which had been enemies. And so uh, it's what it takes to bring disputing parties to one -ment, to reconciliation. And what's required to come to this one -ment is whatever the offended party requires. Meaning this, if you offend someone, you don't get to choose what you do to make things right. The person who is offended gets to make that choice. So if you say something stu stupid or hurtful to your spouse, the way to make it right is to do what, whatever they have you to do. You know, some people say, well, just, just apologize. Just say you're sorry. And that's a great start. But that's not all that it takes. John the Baptist was talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and he said in Matthew 3, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. In other words, actions speak louder than words. Sometimes you just need to see a sorry. Well, theologically and spiritually speaking, atonement is what it takes for you and me to be at one mint with God. What it takes for us to be reconciled to him because of our sin. That is for, for us to say and to show that we are sorry for our sins. And atonement is a huge topic, not just in the book of Leviticus, but it's all throughout the Bible. And so before we get too far along, uh, so you just, you aren't confused, you need to understand for, for us today, Jesus is the only way to have at one mint atonement with God. So if you've been reading the book of Leviticus, this is a very difficult book to understand. And if you're coming here this morning and you're relatively new to the faith, or maybe you're just kind of checking things out, uh, there are a I just don't want you to be confused by this book because there are a lot of strange instructions in Leviticus, a lot of ceremonies and rituals and sacrifices and cleansings. And so you need to understand that the instructions in the book of Leviticus are not binding on us anymore. Like we don't have to do animal sacrifices anymore for our sins. And we don't have to go through all these prescribed rituals and ceremonies that are laid out in this book. Like, I'm always leery of when people use verses from the book of Leviticus to try and tell people 
how they should or shouldn't be living, what they should and shouldn't be doing. Like there are a lot of people who like to quote from Leviticus 19.28 to tell people that they shouldn't get tattoos. Because Leviticus 19.28 says, do not cut your bodies for the dead or put tattoo marks on yourselves. I am the Lord. The problem is those same people that point out this verse, they ignore a lot of other verses that are in Leviticus and even in the same chapter. Like verse 19 says, do not wear clothing woven of two kinds of material. And so if I hear someone quoting from Leviticus to tell someone not to have a tattoo, I look at them and I go, is that a cotton polyester blend shirt you're wearing? Because if it is, you are unclean. And then I douse them with water, right? So much of the instruction in this book was to set the Israelites apart as a nation. Some of the rules were, were for the specific nation to be governed by. I, I would almost compare it to like our traffic laws today. If you go to another country, they may have different laws for the road, right? Different traffic laws. We have to understand context. Context is so important. You see, God wanted this nation, the Israelites, to, to be like none other, to be set apart. Because through them, something incredible was going to happen. The coming of the Messiah. And so he wanted them to be different. And although some of their regulations and observances and ceremonies, they're, they're a bit strange to us today, Colossians 2.17 says about these ceremonies that these are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. And so all of these ceremonies and regulations, they were a foreshadowing of the things that were to come. And it would, it would form the backdrop for what would be fulfilled in Jesus. Like, if God didn't set up the sacrificial system that we read about in Leviticus, then Jesus dying on the cross it would have made absolutely no sense, right? But because of the backdrop, background that God was laying for his people in Leviticus, when Jesus went to the cross and he died, the people began to have a clarity that he was dying for a reason. He was dying for their sins. He was the sacrificial lamb. So the book of Leviticus is, is God giving the Israelites through, through Moses and then through the priests what was required by him to be holy and therefore be able to approach him with confidence. Be at one with him. So last week we talked about the Israelites. They had been in Egypt for about 400 years, most of this time in slavery. And during that time, they were influenced by a very pagan and hedonistic culture. The Egyptians worshipped many, many gods, and, and some of them they worshipped in, in very bizarre ways. And so when, when God brought the Israelites out of Egypt, out of slavery, they had to sort of be reintroduced to their God, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob the God of Joseph. And they needed, they needed to know their God, but not just that. They needed to know how to relate to him. So God led the Israelites out of Egypt and he brought them to the foot of Mount Sinai where Moses received the Ten Commandments. God laid out the ground rules about who he was and who they were and how to come into his presence. So the book of Leviticus really only covers about one month of time in the life of Israel. It's mostly instruction throughout this book, and there's a little bit of narrative, but it really serves like an addendum to the book of Exodus. We, we see in Exodus how the Israelites had come out of Egypt behind the, the incredible leadership of Moses. They crossed the Red Sea on dry ground. They escaped from Pharaoh and his army. God provided food for them, manna and quail. God would provide water for them when they needed it. And after two months of traveling in the desert, they came to the foot of Mount Sinai. This happened in Exodus chapter 19. And so for the rest of the book of Exodus and all of Leviticus and the first few chapters in, in Numbers, this is where they are at Mount Sinai. And God was using this time to teach them what it would take to know him. If you remember from last week, they, they learned a few things just from the outset. They, they learned, first of all, that their God was a holy God. And when they understood God's holiness they could see their sinfulness more clearly, how utterly sinful they were. That was true for them then. That's true for us today. If we could truly understand the holiness of God, I think we would have a similar reaction to how Isaiah had when, when he was uh, confronted with the majesty of God. In Isaiah 6, 5, he said, Woe to me, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. And so they learned. They learned that their God was holy, but they also learned that their God was unapproachable. So they had a major problem, didn't they? They, they served a holy God, 
but they were sinful, and therefore there was this huge separation, an enormous canyon between them and, between, and, and God because of their sin. But they also learned that their God made it possible for them to be holy. And although there was this huge chasm between them and God, God loved them. God had this awesome plan and purpose for them. Through these Israelites, God was going to bring salvation to the world. And so God wanted a relationship with them. And that's what Leviticus and the law is about. God was giving them a bridge, a bridge across this gap of sin so the people could be holy as he is holy. But let me just tell you from the outset here that this bridge that he was giving them was only a temporary bridge. We might compare it to like a swinging bridge today. What he did through Christ was a big, sturdy, permanent, everlasting bridge. So the ancient Israelites had an entire set a day that they set aside every year in celebration of God bridging this gap. They called it the Day of Atonement. And during this day, sacrificial activities went with this celebration. They did it every year on the same day. It was the 10th day of the seventh month on the Jewish calendar. And modern Jews, they still celebrate it today. They call it Yom Kippur. You, you may see it on your calendars. Yom means day, and Kippur means to cover. It is a day of covering. Jews today, they celebrate it as the holiest day of their year. And they observe it with a complete fast from food and drink. They abstain from marital intimacy. They don't bathe or wear lotions or creams on this day. They call it afflicting our souls. And that comes from God's instructions in Leviticus on this day that they were to deny themselves, or some versions say afflict ourselves. Leviticus 23, 27 says that the tenth, about this day, the tenth day of the seventh month is the day of atonement. Hold a sacred assembly and deny yourselves or afflict yourselves and present a food offering to the Lord. Do not do any work on that day because it is the day of atonement when atonement is made, be, made for you before the Lord your God. Those who do not deny themselves on that day must be cut off from their people. And so the detailed instructions for this day were given to God, by God to Moses and they're recorded in Leviticus 16. Moses would then pass them down to his brother Aaron, the high priest. And it was the high priest who really had the main job on this day of atonement. He was the only one who could go into the portion of the tabernacle called the Holy of Holies or, or the Most Holy Place. And there he would make atonement or reparations for the sins of the people. Listen to what God told Moses for this special day in Leviticus 16, starting in verse 2. The Lord said to Moses, Tell your brother Aaron that he is not to come whenever he chooses into the most holy place, behind the curtain, in front of the atonement cover on the ark, or else he'll die. He not just go in whenever he wanted to. For I will appear in the cloud over the atonement cover. This is how Aaron is to enter the most holy place. He must first bring a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. And then God would go on to tell Moses some more instructions about how to come into the most holy place, what sacrifices need to be brought, what to wear specifically, how to wash, how many goats to bring, how to slaughter the animals, and what to do with the blood. One of the goats was to be sacrificed to the Lord as God would be conditioning his people to know and to remember and understand that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness for sins. And then the sins of the people would be symbolically placed on a second goat and it would be released into the wilderness representing how their sins were carried away. And this is where we get the term scapegoat from. Then down in verse 34, we read that this is to be a lasting ordinance for you. Atonement is to be made once a year for all the sins of the Israelites. And so if you're reading this like for the first time, you're probably thinking, my goodness, God is really into the details here. And that's one of the reasons that this book is so difficult to understand. It's, it's got so much detail in it. But again, what was happening with this sacrificial system would form the backdrop for understanding what Jesus did on the cross. And so this Day of Atonement was a big deal. It became a national day of rest and prayer, fasting, and solemn gratitude. But Leviticus 16 is really only the culmination of this special day. It came about because of something that had happened back in the book of Exodus. So what I want to do with the rest of my time is to show you why and how this day got started to begin with. It wasn't just that the people were sinful all the time. Something happened that caused God to require it. So we're going to back up and we're going to look in Exodus chapter 19. 
So by the time we get to Exodus 19, as we've said before, Moses had led the Israelites out of Egypt in this mass exodus. His father-in-law, Jethro, had given him some incredible leadership advice. And now it was the first day of the, first, uh, the third month, and God called for Moses to come up the mountain. He wanted to talk to him. So the Bible says this in Exodus 19.3, Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So we see that God had great plans for these people. So Moses told the people what God had said, and they said this. They said, we will do everything the Lord has said. We're going to obey. We will do it. And in verse 9, the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to come to you in a dense cloud so that the people will hear me speaking with you, and they will always always put their trust in you. So God came down to the people so that they could hear God speaking to Moses, and they would understand that Moses was going to be God's mouthpiece. And in chapter 20, is where we read of how God gave Moses the Ten Commandments and and even repeated one of those commandments. In verse 23, he said, Do not make any gods to be alongside me. Do not make for yourselves gold, gods of silver or gods of gold. And if you don't know the story, you may be wondering, well, why did God repeat this commandment? Well, it becomes very, very important a little later, and we'll see how in just a second. So from Exodus chapter 21 through 24, God gave some more laws and then promises to bless them if they stayed true to him. He then called Moses back up on the mountain and he told him to bring Aaron and Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 elders of Israel. So only Moses could come close to God. The others had to keep their distance. But whatever God said, they agreed to obey. Well, then God called Moses further up the mountain for an extended stay, 40 days and 40 nights. And so hold on for just a moment. We're going to fly through the next few chapters. I want to do a a super quick walkthrough of Exodus. If you have your Bibles open or your Bible app open, you may notice some of the headings as I go through each chapter. In Exodus chapter 25, it describes how God gave Moses specific instructions on how to build the Ark of the Covenant, its golden cover, the table of the bread of presence, and the lampstand with seven, seven lamps. Chapter 26, God gives more detailed instructions for the tabernacle, uh, talking about this curtain with finely twisted linen and gold hooks. In chapter 27, more instructions that God gives for the altar and the courtyard and the oil for the lampstand. In chapter 28, God gives instructions for what Aaron, the high priest, would have to wear. He was very specific on what he would have to wear. In chapter 29, God tells him how to consecrate and ordain Aaron's sons to be priests. In chapter 30, God gave Aaron and his sons more instructions on what they were to do as they would enter the tabernacle area when they would offer sacrifices. How they had to wash themselves, be anointed with oil, burn incense, and they had to do things exactly like God instructed or there would be punishment. Then in chapter 31, God reemphasizes the Sabbath day of rest And then we read in verse 18 that when the Lord finished speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him the two tablets of the covenant law, the tablets of stone inscribed by the finger of God. We know these as the Ten Commandments. And so to summarize, in Exodus chapters 20 through 31, God gave them commandments and specific instructions on how to make everything for their worship and how the priests would lead it. And then we get to Exodus chapter 32. And Exodus chapter 32 is a very pivotal and awful moment. Remember how God had repeated this commandment not to make any idols of gold or silver? Well, evidently they had forgotten about this. Moses had been gone for only 40 days and nights. And in Exodus 32 verse 1 we read, When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Just weeks earlier, they had witnessed these plagues in Egypt and the amazing rescue of God's people as as God led them out of Egypt. They'd walked across, they'd walked on, on dry land 
as, as God had parted the Red Sea. And now they're asking Aaron to make them some gods. And Aaron gave in. He had them bring in their jewelry. And verse 4 says that he took what they handed him and made it into an idol, cast into the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. And then they said, These are your gods, Israel. These are your gods, Israel, who brought you out of Egypt. What a slap in the face of the one true God. The next day they had a festival, and verse 6 says that they sat down to eat and drink and, to get, and got up to indulge in revelry. Only six weeks prior, they had said to God, we will do everything you say. And now they're worshiping an idol that they had made for themselves. God was so angry. So he's still uh, talking to Moses on the mountain. He says to Moses, I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are a stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. So God's saying, I'm done. I'm going to destroy these people and I'm going to start over. I'm going to start over with you, Moses. But Moses pleaded with God to dis- that, that he would not destroy them. And, and you can read about Moses' arguments uh, in the next few verses. They must have been pretty persuasive because in verse 14 it says, Then the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster he had thre- threatened. Now, I don't know what these verses do to your theology, how that impacts your prayer life, that God changed his mind when Moses pleaded with him. Uh, we're not going to get into that, but that's something to chew on, isn't it? But after this, Moses went down the mountain, and he had the stone tablets with the Ten Commandments on them. And verse 19 says that when Moses approached the camp, and he saw the calf and the dancing, his anger burned. And he threw the tablets out of his hands, breaking them into pieces at the foot of the mountain. And he took the calf that the people had made, and I imagine that he, he knocked it over. And it was like our first instance of cow tipping ever. Right? He knocked over the calf. I don't know if he did that. But he took the calf that the people had made and he burned it in the fire and then he ground it into powder, scattered it on the water. And I love this. And then he made the Israelites drink it. You drink this. You drink this. After what you did, right? And they had to drink it. God was so angry. And Moses was so angry. And so Moses called them to repentance. He said, whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And all the Levites rallied to him. The next day, Moses stood in front of the people, the ones who had repented and lived. And Moses said, you have committed a great sin. Now I will go up to the Lord. And perhaps, just maybe, hopefully, I can make atonement for your sin. Hopefully, we we can bring it back together. Hopefully, there can be reconciliation. Perhaps. And so Moses went back to the Lord and he tried to make another deal. He said, oh, what a great sin these people have committed. They have made themselves gods of gold. But now, please forgive their sin. But if not, if you won't forgive them, then blot me out of your book you have written. Did you catch that? Moses was willing to go to hell for these people. He was willing to give his life for them. Forgive them, I will give my life. But God said, no, that's, that's not going to work. To be honest, Moses was not a good enough sacrifice. So God was going to punish those who deserved punishment. And I want you to notice what happened next. At the beginning of chapter 33, God, God basically told Moses, I'm out. I'm done. I'm not going to be with them for now. Verse 3 says, God said to Moses, go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you. I'm not, I'm not going because you are a stiff-necked people and I might destroy you on the way. I almost read into this like, I can't trust myself with these people. I just might burn them up, you know? I'm so angry with what they had done. And so for now, God's presence did not stay with the people, although it did remain with Moses. God only came to them when he went to talk to, to Moses at the tent of meeting and it was outside the camp. And when Moses would go to talk to God, he would wear a veil afterwards so that the people couldn't see the reflected glory of God. Moses continued to pray for the people, but they had lost his presence. And so here's the first main lesson about atonement. Some of you guys are going, first lesson? Oh my goodness, you're finally getting there? They're short, okay? 
Here's the first main lesson about atonement. Sin keeps God away. Sin keeps God away. The Bible says that when people found out that God's presence would not be with them any longer, they mourned. And for good reason. Without the presence of God, it meant no blessing, no favor. And now here's the burning question on all of their minds. How do we get God to come back? How do we make atonement? How can we be at one mint with God again? Well, two things had already been tried. The first thing is that they tried to say they're sorry. They said they're sorry. When Moses stood in front of them and called them to repentance, they rallied to his side. There were only 3,000 people that chose not to, chose not to repent, and they died. But there were maybe a couple million Israelites at this time. So a lot of them, they said they're sorry. They repented. And sorry is a great place to start. But when it comes to sinning against a holy God, sorry just doesn't cut it. It's not enough. So the other thing that they tried was that, that Moses offered himself as a sacrifice for them. And Moses was a good man. Like the Bible tells us that he was more humble than any other man. Moses was a great man, really. But Moses was still a sinner. So Moses being sacrificed would not be a good enough sacrifice to cover over their sin. So what could they try next? How could they make things right with God? Well, if you remember chapters 20 through 31 of Exodus detailed all the commandments and instructions for their worship. And then chapter 32 is when they, they rebelled with the golden calf. Chapter 33 is when God takes his presence for them, from them. In chapter 34, Moses goes back up the mountain to get a second copy of the Ten Commandments uh, since he had thrown them down and he had destroyed them in his anger. This time they weren't inscribed by the finger of God. Moses had to chisel them out himself. And then for the, from the, rest, for the rest of Exodus, chapters 35 through 40, the people spent the next seven months carrying out all of the detailed instructions that God had given them in chapters 20 through 31. And in Exodus 39, 42, we read that the Israelites had done all the work just as the Lord commanded Moses. Can you see what they were trying now? The third thing that they were trying to do was have meticulous obedience to God's laws. If we can just obey it just right. They were trying to get God's presence and favor back by strict obedience to his instructions. And so day after day after day, they worked and they worked and they worked. But even after seven months, it wasn't enough. So what did it take then? How did they get the presence and blessing and favor of God to come back to them? Well, Leviticus 9 tells us everything was set up for their worship. All the work was done. And in Leviticus 9, 6, we read, Then Moses said, This is what the Lord has commanded you to do so that the glory of the Lord may appear to you. Here's how you get him back. Moses said to Aaron, Come to the altar and sacrifice your sin offering and your burnt offering and make atonement for your, yourself and the people. Sacrifice the offering that is for the people and make atonement for them as the Lord has commanded. And Aaron did exactly what he was supposed to do. And here's what we read at the end of Leviticus 9. It says, Then Aaron lifted his hands towards the people and blessed them. And having sacrificed the sin offering, the burnt offering, and the fellowship offering, he stepped down. Moses and Aaron then went into the tent of meeting. When they came out, they blessed the people. And the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. He was back. Fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat portions of the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted for joy and they fell down. What incredible joy they must have felt as God's presence was brought back. But what was it that made atonement for the people? What was it? It was the blood of the sacrifice. This is why the writer of Hebrews would say that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So do you know, want to know how to have God's presence and blessing in your life? It doesn't just happen by saying you're sorry. And it's not by being a good person. Like if Moses wasn't good enough, we probably aren't either. And it's not even by doing the right things or going through the right rituals. We aren't righteous on our own. There's only one way, and it's the second main lesson about atonement. To get God's presence and blessing in your life, trust Jesus. Trust in his shed blood on the cross. You see, you and I, we are the guilty party. 
we have absolutely no leverage with God. We, we don't get to decide how to make things right between us and God. Only God gets to. And this is how he did it. God is holy and God is just and someone had to be punished. Somebody's blood had to be shed for there to be atonement, for there to be at one mint again. And so God sent his son, the perfect, spotless, sinless son of God, became our sacrificial lamb. It was his life for ours. He paid our sin debt. Paul would say in Romans 3.25, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood. And it's to be received by faith. 1 John 4.10, John says, This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. He sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. His life for ours. Why would God do this? Because we are his people. Because he loves us that much that he would want at one mint with us. We serve an incredible God, don't we? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for what Jesus did for us. And as we read through Leviticus, we see all the meticulous details of these sacrifices and these ceremonies and these regulations. And, and they're hard to understand many times. And sometimes we get lost in the details. But we see that there was a purpose for these. You are conditioning your people to know that without the shedding of blood... There is no forgiveness of sins. But it wasn't just any blood. Each year it was a spotless, perfect lamb that they would sacrifice. And this would only temporarily cover the sins of the people because they were awaiting something bigger. They were awaiting an ultimate sacrifice, ultimate atonement. When you would send your son, the Messiah would come and live a sinless life and he would be sacrificed on that cross. And his blood would cover over our sins. He would take our sins upon himself. And then he would take the punishment of those sins. Your wrath was poured out on that sin that he was bearing. He would take our sin and then we would get to be clothed in his righteousness is the most unfair trade-off in all of human history. So God, we thank you that you are an unfair God because we don't get what we deserve. What we deserve is punishment. What we deserve is death. What we deserve is separation from you. What we deserve is hell, eternal separation from you. And we couldn't do a thing about it. We couldn't be good enough. We couldn't say, I'm sorry enough. We couldn't sacrifice enough animals. There was nothing we could do to bridge the gap that we caused because of our sin. And so you, you did the work to reconcile us. Though we are the guilty party, you're the one who took the step, the huge step that we couldn't take to bridge that gap by sending your son. We can't say I'm sorry enough. We can't say thank you enough. Forgive us when we take your sacrifice for granted. God, we thank you for this atonement sacrifice, this atoning sacrifice of Jesus. It's in his name I pray. Amen. So this morning, if you have a decision to make about Jesus, responding to what he has done for you and for me, we want to give you an opportunity to respond, uh, to place your trust in him, the work and the work that he has done for us on the cross, to confess him as Lord, to repent of your sin, to follow through with baptism. What a beautiful picture of atonement baptism is. Where we, we are one with him in his death and in his burial and in his resurrection. And so if you have a decision to make about Jesus, uh, Joel is going to be up here to your left. I'm going to be up here to your right. And we'd love to talk with you about that. We'd love to pray with you. Um, 
We'd love to walk you through what that next step might be in your life. So if you have a decision to make, we'll be up here as we sing this last song. We stand and sing.